So let's begin. I'd like to talk about the master plan that God has for our lives. And you know, this morning, like I just mentioned, we had a baptism, and really, baptism symbolizes God's master plan for each one of our lives. Baptism is the first thing. Baptism is a symbol of repentance. It's about people changing their minds about sin. It's them understanding that sin is not going to bring them life, that sin is going to take them down, and sin is going to steal life from them. And so then the second thing is baptism is a symbol of cleansing. So it's the old sinful person that goes down under the water, and all of their junk and all of their dirt and filth and sin is washed away, and it's a fresh, new person that comes up out of the water. Isn't that an incredible symbolism? We don't believe that baptism saves us, but we believe baptism is a necessary step that each person should go through. Baptism is basically a step of obedience. And the third thing, which I so... graciously tried to explain before is that baptism is identifying with Christ. People who are being baptized are telling us that they have decided to be followers of Jesus. So rather than following their old selfish ways of living, ways that have got them in trouble, they have decided to make a change and they are going to identify themselves with Jesus. And isn't this what we all want, to be identified with Jesus, to have new life promised to us, joy and peace? These things, this is the kind of life that I believe we all want. So I want to talk about God's master plan for us that is symbolized in baptism. I want to um, assure you, though, that this is not necessarily just an easy thing. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to lay back on our couches and watch TV for the rest of our life and just be really happy and joyful the whole time. It doesn't mean that in the summertime we're going to tiptoe through the tulips and in the wintertime on days like today we're going to just go out and go tobogganing or sledding and just have a good time or roast marshmallows by a fire you want me to continue or should I move on from, my, from the pictures here? You know, life, because we've given our life to Jesus Christ, because we've decided to become a follower of, her, of Him, doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to be easy in our life. But I want to begin this morning with a psalm that David wrote. And not only is it fitting for the people who were baptized or for people who are following Jesus, I believe there's a prophetic meaning in these verses for many of us this year as well. I want to read to you just the two verses, the first two verses from Psalms 144. King David wrote, he said, Blessed be the Lord, my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. I was reading this in my private devotions a while ago, and I just kind of had fresh new revelation from these verses. King David wrote this, and he was arguably the best king in the history of the world. Yes, he definitely had his faults, and he paid the price for his faults, but he had a, go a heart that chased after God. And he believed in God regardless of the circumstances, and he always saw that God was going to come through for him. I mean, in these verses, he, he recognized that God was his fortress, that God was his stronghold, that God was his place of refuge, that God was his deliverer, that God was his shield, and that even as king, God would subdue people under him. What an incredible revelation that King David had. 
If you follow the story of his life, it's an incredible story. David went from being a shepherd to taking on Goliath, a huge giant with a slingshot, to running away from the person who was king, the person who was king, King Saul at the time, was trying to kill him, and David had to run for his life. And we're not exactly sure how long this period of time lasted, but it was probably several years. And then... From there, he rose to kingship himself. And he took on many different nations, many different enemies. And he always received victory over his enemies. That's that's quite an incredible story. But if you look at the passage that I just read to you, one thing David recognized was that it was God who trained his hands for war. This psalm doesn't say that God fought and won all of David's battles for him, but God trained his hands for war. You know, when David was herding sheep, Scripture tells us that lions and bears would come against the flock. And David, what he would do is he would take whatever he had, his shepherd staff, I don't know, I'm not a shepherd myself, but he would, he would give the bearer, the lion, a good thump, Scripture says. And if the lion or the bear would not release the lamb, then Scripture says that David would grab the lion by the beard and slay the lion. How many of you would do that? Come on, you guys are supposed to be so big and brave. All of you that are complaining because it's 30 below, how many of you, how many of you would like to grab a lion by its beard and, and slay the lion? I mean, man, I, I wouldn't think that would be hard at all, right? Somebody told me this morning that I shouldn't lie when I'm in church. Yeah, I shouldn't lie, period. Yeah, that's, that's good. No, I, I can't imagine what that would have been like. But do you realize that it was God who trained David's hands for war? And so what God would allow is lions and bears to come against the flock. And in David chasing off or killing the lions and the bears, actually what was happening is David was being trained for war. That, I firmly believe, that is what gave David the courage to take on Goliath. David understood that his Lord would come through for him, and so he could fight battles that seemed to be far greater than who he was or what he was able to fight. David was able to do that. Why? Because he had been trained. God had trained his hands for war, and David recognized this. You know, I wonder how many people would quit being a shepherd as soon as a lion and a bear came. Hey, this is too tough. I'm out of here. But with that kind of a mindset, you know what would happen? That person would never rise up to the potential that God had for them. God uses hardship and difficulty sometimes in our lives to train us and to make us into the person that God wants us to be. God uses these difficulties, God uses these hardships to make us and to mold us into a person who can fight, into a mighty soldier. And I believe over the last number of years, many of people in this congregation have gone through incredible struggles and incredible difficulties, and there's been different things that have happened to them. But you know what I firmly believe? I firmly believe that God is preparing these people for war. God is preparing us for war. God is preparing us to fight. We're talking about making a difference in this town, in this city. And I think... The training that we've received over the last number of years, we will be able to use that to win battles. Sometimes, to be honest, it's been really easy or really tempting to just run away. 
But when we face the battles, when we face the lions and the bears, we're becoming stronger. So now we can go and we can fight and we can make a difference in this city. Let me be very clear when I talk about us fighting, when I talk about us warring, I'm not talking about us in the sense that we go out and we force our way on people or that we beat people up. I remember I was raised as a Mennonite. I don't say that very often. Not that I'm ashamed of it at all, but I just don't like people to be able to identify me. But one of the, one of the things of being a Mennonite is that you were non-resistant. That meant you never went to war. That meant you never fought. And that was deeply, deeply, deeply ingrained in me at that time. There's a lot of stuff about that that I still appreciate. Anyways, I just tell you that because I want you to see when somebody would talk about warring or somebody would talk about fighting, it would just go against my grain. I just didn't like it when people would use that kind of language, just being brutally honest. But when I came to realize that this kind of fighting is you fight with love, you fight with gentleness, you fight with with respecting other people, you fight, you fight the enemy through prayer. You fight this way, it makes a lot more sense to me. So when I'm talking this morning about us being trained to fight, I'm talking about us being trained to love other people and not to let difficulties or circumstances stand in our way, but we are going to make a difference. When the Apostle Paul talked about fighting or talked about warring, look at what he said in 2 Corinthians. He said, we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We are beaten, put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, by our understanding, by our patience, by our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us and by our sincere love. This is how the Apostle Paul fought, and this is how we need to fight as well. Could I get one weak amen? You know, we like to be aggressive, and I like to be aggressive too. I was taught to be aggressive, just not in the fighting way. But when I was younger, I was taught to be aggressive, and I think this is good. But we need to be aggressive in loving people. We need to be aggressive by being patient with people, by letting our kindness show. And people, let me tell you, this is not being wimpy. This is tough. And it is hard to do. But this is how we are called to fight. In verse 7, the Apostle Paul said, We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack, and the left hand, he's talking about a shield for defense. If you think of the Apostle Paul's life, he patiently endured trouble. He was beaten up. Literally, he was beaten up. Today, we get so nervous because somebody doesn't like us or because somebody insults us. Come on. For the Apostle Paul, it was way more than somebody making a smart comment about them. This was real stuff. He faced angry mobs. He was put in prison. And he responded with purity and understanding and patience and kindness. So when I talk about us going to war, I'm not talking about us fighting physically or verbally abusing people. But what we're called to do, in a nutshell, what we're called to do is to love other people. Sometimes we get the idea that life should be so easy and blessings should just fall into our laps. And hey, nobody likes it when blessings fall into their laps more than I do. And God does provide incredible times of blessing for us. He absolutely does. 
But sometimes God uses hardships as training so that we can take on bigger battles, so that we can do more, so that we can accomplish more. How do we respond when things don't go well? Do we quit and struggle to get rid of all of our pain and hardship in our life? Do we allow our pleasure? Do we allow ourselves the pleasure of self pity? Or the pleasure of being offended? There's pleasure in that, you know. There's something kind of sicky sweet about allowing yourself to pity yourself. Oh, woe is me. Do you realize what Dan said about me last week? I went on Facebook. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday, I just so didn't want to clean my house. I so didn't want to clean the house. And I was just looking for a little sympathy. Do you know what Dan said? <laughs> I don't remember, but I'm sure it was very insulting. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't helpful. There's pleasure in allowing ourselves to be offended or in pitying ourselves. But if we're going to fight and we're going to battle, we have to come to the place where we don't let that stuff take us off course. You know what? Literally, we don't have a minute's time, a minute's time to waste by pitying ourselves or by being offended. We need to push through and push forward regardless. We have to take control of our mind, and really that's what I'm talking about. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, the Apostle Paul says, we capture like prisoners of war every thought Capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. You know, our minds are incredibly powerful things. And if we're going to fight and if we're going to win, we need to capture every thought and insist it bows in obedience to God. You know, fear, it seems like fear is knocking on our door. We know that there's something that we need to do. Loving somebody who's unlovable, for example, or doing good to somebody who hates you. Fear knocks at our door when we know that we need to rise above that and do good to somebody who needs to have good done to them. And this is not easy. And it takes courage. But we need to take Every thought like that captive. You know, I'm so proud of Jerry. So proud of Jerry. During our prayer and fasting this year, Jerry decided that she was supposed to go visit in jails. Look at this sweet, pretty little girl. You still love me, Jerry? Yeah, it's borderline. Remember what I said about taking thoughts captive and not being offended. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, of course, it's not practical for Jerry to go wander through the jails herself. But God is using her, and she has um, been in contact with somebody who does go. Um, somebody who, remember Chuck Colson's ministry from when he was alive, his prison ministry? Well, that's still ongoing, and we have a connection with that ministry. 
somebody who's actually talked in our church here is running that ministry, lives in Calgary right now. But I put Jerry in contact with him and he's laid out some ground rules and, and uh, has told Jerry that she needs to raise a team to do that. But you know what? Jerry has overcame her fear and she's going to march ahead and she's going to do that anyway. Take every thought captive when that fear comes. No, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this anyway. It's important, it's really important that we, that we do that. You know, I remember when I started to visit in jail a long time ago, that was scary. It was scary. And I remember our, my orientation, they had two big guys there who I don't think were Christians. Two big guys, and I took comfort in what they told me. They said, we want you to know that when you come to visit us, you are our guests, and we will look after you. There never was an issue, but you know, to do something strange, to do something different, to do something new takes courage. And we have to take every thought captive so we don't give in to the fear, so that we don't let fear control us. If we let fear control us, we absolutely won't get anything done. Another example, it takes courage to confront people. You'll never know if you confront somebody how it's going to turn out. You know, some people enjoy confrontation. I'm not one of those. In fact, people who enjoy confrontation, I think sometimes they have other issues that they need to work through. They might need to learn gentleness and they might need to learn patience. But if you're like me and you hate confrontation and you avoid it like the plague, the fact of the matter is you're not going to be a very good soldier. You're not going to be a very good warrior if you don't face up and do the confronting that you need to do in life. You know, some of us are married to... Boy, that isn't coming out right. <laughs> Could I have some water? I need some courage to go forward here. Thanks, Odd. <laughs> Joyce, why don't you come and stand beside me? <laughs> so people who are watching the tape, they can understand why I might be nervous and intimidated. <laughs> See, nobody ever, pity, nobody ever, ever pities me. Nobody understands. <laughs> I need to move on. If you're in a relationship where one person is really strong, has a strong personality, and you're a get-along kind of person, it's going to take courage for you to confront the strong person. But if you're going to have the marriage if you're going to have the relationship with that person that you want to have, sometimes you're going to need to stand up and to tell them like it is. And that takes courage. You're not going to have the life that God intended for you to have if you just become a doormat and just take everything all the time. You need to, let me give you a little wisdom, you need to choose the setting and you need to choose the time. But you need to do it. And if you're the person who has a strong personality, can I give you some really good advice? When somebody is confronting you, can I just be me and not be a pastor on the stage for a little bit? your wife, or sometimes it's your husband, if they're 
approaching you, shut up and listen. Stop defending yourself and just shut up and listen and take it. This stuff isn't easy. This stuff isn't easy, but we need to battle for our relationships. We need to battle for our marriages. We need to, we need to fight for our children. We need to fight for our homes, that our homes can be the place of peace that God intended for them to be. And you know, with our children, I'm old enough. I should quit talking like this, I guess, but I'm old enough to see how raising children has changed over the last 20 or 30 years. And I am not in favor, oh my goodness, if you hear me thinking that I'm in favor of beating kids, you do not hear me at all. But sometimes we need to teach our children to obey. And sometimes you have to just rise up and take control of your home. And you don't have to use physical force to do that all the time. I'm walking on thin ice. I recognize that. I'm not talking about abusing kids, but you know what? Scripture says that we need to teach our children to obey. And sometimes I think we just teach kids to obey by distracting them. Oh, Freddie, please quit writing on the wall. Come over here and I'll give you a chocolate bar. You know, once in a while, hey, Freddie, quit writing on the wall needs to be enough to make him stop doing it. I'll never forget my youngest daughter. Her boy was about two years old and she's teaching him how to obey. She's teaching him how to um, be obedient and he kept pulling on the flap for our vacuum flow right kept pulling on that and she told him not to and he defiantly kept doing it and so she told him to go stand in the corner and so he stood in the corner and then he pretended to snore when he was in there <laughs> He didn't get beat for that either. I just, as a grandpa, I just thought that was really, really funny. <laughs> I'd already fought the battles with his mother, so. Yeah. The moral of the story is what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say, and I've got off track a little bit, but you know what? We need to, we need to fight these battles and win. We need to not let Fear, control us. We need to make sure that we do what's right because it's right. When I started in ministry, I told my kids, they were pretty young at the time, I told them, I said, the job I have now, I said, that won't change who we are. I said, we'll do what's right because it's right, and we won't do what's wrong because it's wrong. And that's going to be the thing that guides us. That's going to think, be the thing that directs us in life. And you know what? More or less, we've kept that. We haven't been perfect in that. But I believe if each one of us could catch a vision for that, that if we just do what's right because it's right, and we don't do what's wrong because it's wrong, that will go a long way. You know, keep your homes in order. Fight for your homes is, is how I got off track here. Fight for your homes. Fight for your marriages. Fight for your children. Fight for people. Fight for people. That's just some examples. Also take control of your mind when offenses come your way. You know, there's disappointments that are going to come and we need to take every thought captive so that we can move on. And if, if offenses come and it takes us out of the game, we lose, people. We lose. So we have to, we have to take control 
of our minds so that we can fight and win. And remember, I think sometimes God lets offenses come our way just so we can toughen up a little bit. You know, sometimes your boss is going to be in a bad mood. And you can quit and run. But you know what? If you do that all the time, you're never going to learn what God has you to learn. Sometimes you need to stand and take it and keep your mouth shut. That doesn't mean that you can't speak sometimes, but there's a time to just allow the offense to just roll off your back. If we would do that, if we would do that, it would go a long way. I firmly believe that over the last number of years, that God has allowed different things to happen for us to go through different challenges so that we can toughen up and we can be ready to fight and we can go all of the way and accomplish something. You know, there's people, there's people in our city who are suffering. There's people in our city who are dying literally through drug overdoses, there's so much stuff going on right now. I'm not a gloom and doom person. But I know that it is time for us to rise up. And I believe this can be our finest hour. Scripture is full about how God cares about widows and orphans. How he cares about the poor. And you know what? He's calling us to rise up and to make a difference. It is time for us to toughen up. And it is time for us to fight to make a difference in people's lives. I firmly believe the door is open. I firmly believe that heaven is shining down upon us. The cloud that was over so many people's lives is lifted. And I think we can march forward and we can make a difference in this city. Look around. There's not many of us. And I could start to list the things that are against us, but I don't care. I firmly believe that we are called to go forward and to make a difference this year. This is God's master plan for us. God has prepared us to fight. God has trained our hands for war, so to speak, and we can go and make a difference. Let's take every thought captive. Let's go all the way for Jesus. Let's not let fear control us. And let's march forward. Next Sunday, like Joyce mentioned, next Sunday after church, we want to discuss strategies to fight, strategies to make a difference. I would encourage you to come and to be a part of that. Because let me tell you, I don't know how to say this strong enough. You were not called to just have a peaceful life. Yes, God brings us peace and God gives us joy, but you were not called to just go sit on the couch and do nothing. God wants to use you. God wants to use you to make a difference. God wants you to love other people to life. And the big thing is, are we willing, are we going to be willing to allow that to happen? The church I grew up in, the church I grew up in, got on fire for God. Became a community church. So a lot of people give their hearts to the Lord. So a lot of good stuff happened in a small town of, I think it was a thousand people at the time. 
we had a church of a couple hundred people and God was moving. And I remember one Sunday, I wasn't a pastor at all then. I wasn't a pastor. But they'd ask me to share the message. And at the end of the message, I really felt that it was the Holy Spirit that challenged me to challenge the people. I was talking about the children of Israel, how they'd spent 40 years in the wilderness. And then they came to the edge of the promised land. Actually, they'd spent about a year in the wilderness and they came to the edge of the promised land. And then they had the opportunity to go into the promised land or not. The first time after a year they didn't have enough faith, they didn't do it, so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And then, after 40 years, that entire generation had died. After 40 years, here they are on the edge of the promised land again. And once again, they have the choice, are we going to go in? Or are we going to stay in the wilderness? I believe we're on the edge of the promised land, people. I believe we're on the edge of the promised land where God has called us for this very time. The question is, are we going to go in? You know what's in the promised land? Battles. Fighting. Taking territory. Defeating the enemy. I don't want to spend any more time in the wilderness. I don't want to spend any more time in the desert. God has trained us in the desert and he's prepared us in the desert. Now the challenge is, do we want to stay here or do we want to go in and receive the life that God has for us? It's challenging. It's scary. And it is fun. <laughs>